When I walk into the surgery room, a lot of people think that I'm focused only on the pet on the table and the incision that I'm making, when in actuality, I'm surrounded by a whole ecosystem of colleagues, tools, and different equipment that's all working cohesively in order to make the surgery a success. And I'd like for you to have that same perspective. So to get there, I'm gonna be incrementally introducing the different monitoring equipment on the screen. To start with, I'm gonna introduce you to the Cardell. It's a monitor that we primarily use in order to look at different aspects of the cardiac system. One of the key things that it does is monitor blood pressure. And that's gonna be what we focus on today. I'm Dr. Meggs, and this is Everyday Vet. We're doing a toe amputation on an obese 10 year old cat because he has a tumor on the middle toe of his left front foot. He is laying on his right side and his head is to my left and his butt is to my right. Since he's obese, he is at a higher risk of suppression of his heart system, so we'll want to keep a close eye on the blood pressure. Let's take a look at the Cardell. The patient is hooked up to EKG leads, which allow the Cardell to monitor his heart rate, and that's going to be the green number in the top right. In an anesthetized cat, we want the heart rate to stay above 100 beats per minute. The red numbers in the lower left are the blood pressure. The first number is systolic pressure, which is the blood pressure that occurs as the heart is beating, and the second number is the diastolic pressure, which is the pressure in between the heartbeats. The number in parentheses is the mean pressure, which is the average throughout the cycle. This patient has a blood pressure cuff on his back leg, and that's hooked up to the cardal, so that new readings can be taken during the surgery. When that mean number turns white, it means that the Cardell is taking a new reading. In an anesthetized cat, we want the blood pressure to stay above 80 over 40 with the mean above 60. Now, I know we just got started, but take a look at that Cardell. He's already got low blood pressure. The sedatives that I give before the surgery, as well as the gas inhalant that he's on now, all cause something called vasodilation, which means that the blood vessel gets wider, so it's not putting as much pressure on the blood anymore. It's kind of like taking a sprayer nozzle off of the hose. When the nozzle was on, the water sprayed out, but as soon as you take the nozzle off, the opening gets bigger, and then the water just trickles out. The drugs are also going to be slowing the heart down, so it's not really pumping as well, which is basically like turning down the water to the hose. So we've essentially turned down the water to the hose while also taking the sprayer, nozzle off, so we don't have as much pressure coming out anymore. Blood pressure is determined by the cardiac output and the resistance along the blood vessel. The anesthesia is causing the low heart rate, which reduces the cardiac output, and it is also causing the vasodilation, which is reducing the vascular resistance. By turning down the sevoflurane, I can counteract both of these effects. The heart rate monitoring is a much more complex discussion, and I'll be covering that in the next episode, but just know for now that I want the heart rate to stay above 100. Because the heart rate and the blood pressure are both low, my assistant is turning down the inhalant gas. We just got a new reading and the blood pressure is still too low. I have a long way to go before I get this toe amputated, so I'm going to have to try something else. If I leave it untreated, prolonged hypotension can actually cause tissue damage from not enough oxygen and blood reaching the tissues. It doesn't matter if I get the toe removed if the patient can't actually even recover from the surgery, so I need to address it. I'm going to increase the cardiac output by increasing the circulating blood volume. So right now, my assistant is going to be giving him a fluid bolus, which is a larger volume of IV fluids administered over a shorter period of time. The heart rate just increased. It's too soon to be from the fluid bolus, so it's most likely because of the lowered sevoflurane. With the lower inhalant gas, the cardiac system won't be as suppressed, and that's going to result in a heart rate increase. And as the heart rate increases, so will the cardiac output. So I'm expecting that the blood pressure should start to improve as well. Now we'll just have to make sure that it doesn't start to wake up, since the gas level is lower. The assistant is actually standing near his head right now so that she can check for facial muscle tone and make sure that he isn't starting to blink, because those are going to be the early warning signs that he might be starting to wake up a little bit. It's definitely a tumor. The toes are a very delicate region because they're used for balance and for tactile sensation. So because of that, there's actually a lot of nerve endings there. 
And now that I've made my way through the skin layer, I'm gonna have to cut through those more sensitive tissues between the toes in order to get that toe separated out. So I'll likely be cutting through some of those nerve endings. And because of the added stimulation, the assistant may end up having to turn up the sevoflurane in order to keep him asleep. So I'm really happy at this point that our efforts to increase the blood pressure have worked and he's no longer hypotensive. So he's now at 85 over 53 with a mean of 66, and the heart rate is even staying above 100. So even though the blood pressure is still at the lower end, we do have some wiggle room, just in case the assistant ends up having to increase that sevoflurane. fluorine. So as I'm continuing to dissect around the toe and try to free it up from its neighbors and get that toe removed, I'm constantly feeling where the joint space is. And that's because I know that I need to make my amputation at the joint. Because if I make the amputation at the joint, then I'm not gonna have to cut through any of the bones. And I planned on which joint I was gonna target before even starting the surgery. So beforehand, I actually took an x-ray of his foot because on the x-ray, the tumor tissue shows up a lot brighter than the surrounding tissue because the tumor is gonna be more dense. So I was able to use that x-ray to see where the edge of the tumor was, compare it to the underlying bones, and from that decide on which joint I was going to need to do my amputation at. And the cat has three finger bones. The distal phalanx is the bone at the tip of the finger where the nail arises from, and then the middle phalanx is the one closest to that, and then the proximal phalanx is the one closest to the wrist. And on his x-ray, the tumor actually extended over the entire distal phalanx, over the entire middle phalanx, and even over part of the proximal phalanx. So I knew before I even started that the only way to remove the entirety of the tumor and do the amputation at the joint was to actually remove all three of those bones and do it where that proximal phalanx meets the bone essentially of his hand. Um, so that's why I'm making my incision more aggressive than it visually looks like it would need to be. If I was doing the amputation lower on the toe, I would actually end up leaving tumor tissue behind. Okay, so now that I got that toe isolated from its neighbors, it's still attached to the joint because there's a tendon that runs along the top of it that allows it to extend the toe. So I'm gonna have to cut through that. That way I can then get down into the joint and disarticulate it. But general tip for any of you that are veterinarians or looking to become a veterinarian, you'll want to angle the tip of the laser towards the proximal phalanx. That way if you accidentally cut too deep, you'll end up cutting into the bone that's being removed anyways. You really want to avoid angling towards the wrist and the, the palm of the foot because you don't want to accidentally char the bone that's going to be remaining behind. I do want to point something else out actually on his x-ray. Um, he was declawed when he was younger and usually when a cat is declawed that distal phalanx is amputated and it would be completely removed. Um, but in his case he still has a distal phalanx. It's just shorter than usual. Um, his declaw was actually done incompletely and some of that distal phalanx was left behind. And because of that, he does have some areas where we can see a partial deformed nail has developed and that distal phalanx is actually shorter than it would typically have been otherwise. Jumping back to that Cardell for a second, I was worried that we may need to increase his sevoflurane as I was dissecting along the sides of the toe, but we didn't end up having to, and his blood pressure and his heart rate are actually staying very stable, so that's great. He's doing really well under anesthesia.
So now I still need to get a little bit down further into that joint. Um, so I'm just gonna keep working my way around the joint until I get all of the connective tissues loosened up. Um, and right now I'm doing what's called blunt dissection. So I can use the tips of the scissors. I can keep the scissors closed, stick the tip of them into the, the actual tissue and then I open up. So it's gonna bluntly spread those tissues away so that I don't accidentally cut through any of the tendons or the ligaments or even the blood vessels that are going to the surrounding toes. And now that I've got it spaced out a little bit better, I can see what I'm aiming for. I can now use the laser to, to make those small cuts in the connective tissue in order to free up that joint. The foot's definitely looking a bit ugly with that toe kind of not fully removed yet, but still a little bit attached and kind of flopping around. Um, but just to kind of allay any fears, I do use a lot of paint and control when I do this type of procedure. As you can imagine, this would otherwise be horribly painful. Um, but before the surgery, when I did his sedative, I actually gave him a medication, an opioid type medication um, to help with, with pain. Um, I also gave him an anti-inflammatory injectable so kind of like an aspirin but one that's actually safe for cats um, I don't recommend really giving over-the-counter pain medications to pets but we do have animal specific ones that are the similar class of medication so I did give an injectable version of that before doing the surgery and then the big player here for pain control was I actually did a nerve block um, so I did an injection around the actual paw of lidocaine so that way it would numb all of those nerves going down to his foot because if we can prevent pain from happening, it's much easier to treat from the prevention standpoint. So if you give them pain medications first and then do the painful procedure, it's much, much easier on them, um, much more comfortable than if we try to treat for pain as we go. So prevention of pain is much more effective than treating only for pain afterwards. But regardless, he's also going to go home on pain medications and a couple of different ones. So he's going to go on the tablet version of the injectable non-steroid anti-inflammatory that he was given. And he's also going to go on a capsule that's um, really good for like nerve type pain. Um, as you can imagine, we're cutting through a lot of nerves since we're removing that toe. So it's really important that we do a multimodal pain approach for him to make sure that he's not uncomfortable. So we want to keep the blood pressure above 80 over 40. So right now the systolic pressure is below 80, but the diastolic pressure is not below 40. So are we or are we not hypotensive? Pause the video, take a moment to think about it, and let me know what you think in the comment section below. I'll give you a little bit and then I'll go ahead and answer it later on. So as I get towards the end here, um, there's really not much tissue left for me to cut through. So I'm just making some very small pinpoint cuts in order to get through the last of those connective tissues. So at this point, since the tissues are so thin, it's really easy to accidentally overshoot and go through a little bit. Um, but the CO2 laser that I'm using is not able to cut through things that are wet. So I have that gauze pad soaked in sterile saline and I'm using it to protect my fingers because if I cut too deep through the tissues and it keeps going even just a split second, the first thing it would otherwise hit is gonna be my finger and that hurts so bad. Um, I've done it before, definitely not recommended. So I always try to be a little bit you know, more on the cautious side and protect anything that I don't wanna have cut, protect it with the wet gauze. And that toe is amputated. So now I'm gonna just take a quick peek at the metacarpal bone, which is where it was attached. I'm just gonna make sure that I didn't cause any damage there. It's looking good, so now we can go ahead and get it sutured. It's a nasty looking growth. That tumor had a weird bluish tint to it, so definitely not normal tissue. I'm very glad that we got that out of there. 
but now that the toe is completely amputated, there's not going to be as much stimulation in that area, so I'm going to have my assistant start to lower the anesthesia, um, and that way we can gradually start waking him up. I don't want to do it too fast because I don't want him to wake up while I'm suturing, but there's not going to be all of that sensation there since we're not making the cuts anymore. Um, so since that blood pressure is pretty low, it'll be a good idea to lower the gas and see if we can't get that blood pressure a bit better. Well, looks like the Cardell just gave us a new blood pressure. Um, wow, so not reading hypotensive, so, but I'm not really panicking because I don't even slightly believe that number. Um, so the thing with machines is that there's always room for error. No machine is perfect, so it's really important that we're keeping an eye on things and paying attention. No way did this pet just go from being pretty hypotensive the whole surgery to now being very high on it. So I'm not gonna trust this reading. What I'm gonna do is keep a close eye on it. So we need to see what the next reading shows us. You never wanna make your judgments based on one blood pressure reading because it might not be accurate. If I had just showed you this screen and it was the only blood pressure reading I'd given you for this whole surgery, you'd be like, wow, that's pretty high. But that's not the case because we had all of those readings the rest of the surgery. So we know that he isn't running high blood pressure. This was one reading out of many. So I don't trust it at all. We'll see what the next reading shows. So I know we haven't really talked about blood pressure before today, and it's a lot to take in. So while we're waiting on the Cardell to give us the next blood pressure reading, let's just kind of recap some of the key points about blood pressure in general. So blood pressure is a result of two different things, cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Cardiac output, we compare to turning up or down the water going to the garden hose. So the cardiac output is gonna be the amount of blood that's being pumped out by the heart. So if we have any issues with the heart or any patient predispositions such as obesity, we're gonna reduce the effectiveness of the heart and we're gonna reduce the cardiac output. Along the same lines, if there's a lot of blood loss, there's gonna be lower volume. So again, cardiac output is gonna be reduced. The other factor we have to consider is going to be the systemic vascular resistance. So that's going to be the resistance along the blood vessel, and we compare that to having the sprayer nozzle on the hose or having it off. So if we've given medications that cause the blood vessel to get much wider, it's like taking that nozzle off of the hose and the blood just kind of trickles out. There's not much resistance. But if we give something that contracts that vessel down, you're going to increase the resistance and the pressure is gonna be higher, kind of like putting the nozzle on the garden hose. So anytime we wanna make adjustments to the blood pressure, we can keep those things in mind in order to determine what we need to do. The American Association of Feline Practitioners actually has a really good article on how to troubleshoot low blood pressure, as well as the other aspects of anesthesia. So I'll make sure to put a link to that page in the video description below. And now we're back at our next blood pressure reading. And as expected, that last reading was much, much higher than what we're looking at. So right now we're at 90 over 51 with a mean pressure of 72. So pretty consistent. We're running a little bit higher than we were for the rest of the surgery. Um, I'm not surprised though. I'm suturing the toe up. He does not need to be kept as deep on the anesthesia. So my assistants have already lowered that inhalant gas in preparation for starting to wake him up. Um, so it's normal for the pressure to go up a little bit. This is a number that I believe because that diastolic pressure is still kind of borderline low. The mean is not hypotensive, but again, not super high. And the systolic is appropriate at 90. So I'm looking at a normal blood pressure reading given the past readings that we've had. So this number, I believe, the last one, not so much. And on that note, I'll give you the answer to that challenge question. So the blood pressure was 69 over 41, and I asked if he was hypotensive or not. Because we wanna keep, in an anesthetized cat, we wanna keep the blood pressure above 80 over 40. So at a systolic of 69, his systolic pressure is lower than the 80. So that would make me think, yes, he's hypotensive. But the diastolic was 41, so that is higher than 40. So I would think, well, he's close, but no, he's not hypotensive. 
But the key thing that I had left out here when I posed the question was the mean blood pressure. So his mean was 55. So when we're looking at blood pressure readings, yes, we want to know diastolic, yes, we want to know systolic, but the key thing that we use and value more over either of those numbers is going to be the mean blood pressure. So we primarily use the mean to gauge hypotensive. And his blood pressure mean was less than 60, he was at 55, so even though that diastolic was technically normal, he would be classified as hypotensive. And now would be a good time for comments time. Garima T asked, is it safe to get a female cat spayed if she is five years old? And I can see why you would ask that, because as cats get older, they are at a higher risk of certain medical conditions. But rather than focus on the age as the primary factor, I tend to focus more on the individual's overall health status. So I do a physical exam first, make sure heart and lungs sound good, make sure the rest of the body looks nice and healthy. And we're also gonna wanna do a blood work panel first too to make sure that the organ function is good. If it's a senior pet, I may even do x-rays first to make sure that there are no structural abnormalities inside. So to answer your question, rather than focus primarily on the age as the factor for seeing if we can do anesthesia, we need to focus more so on the pet's overall health status. And it's definitely a complex topic, and as we proceed, I'll continue to introduce different aspects of anesthesia so you can better understand the impact that it has on your pet, so you'll be more equipped to answer that question. But good thought. And now it's time to answer last episode's challenge question. I had asked, under what circumstances would a pet with bladder stones need a perineal urethrostomy? And Gavin Fleck actually provided an awesome answer. Um, they had said, I think the reason you would want a new location for the urethra is if there is any damage to the urinary tract via passing stones or crystallized urine, or to make the opening larger to allow smaller stones to pass easier. Great job. That's actually really touched on some of the key points there. Um, so the first part that if there's damage to the urinary tract from the passing stones, that can be a really big problem because the urethra is already pretty small and if the stone causes damage along it, we can end up getting scar tissue forming which can even further reduce the size of the urethra. And any pet that has had stones develop and, and get an obstruction from them is going to be at a higher risk of having it happen again. So if we have that scar tissue, it's likely going to be even worse the next time around. And that kind of brings us to the second part too, um, to allow the, or to make the opening larger to allow smaller stones to pass easier. And, and yes, because again, that pet is going to be at an incre increased risk of developing stones again in the future. So having that larger opening might make the difference between having a urinary obstruction and not having any obstruction at all. The only part that I would clarify um, is that crystallized urine, so as long as it's only crystals that are formed and not stones, the crystals can pass without any issue. It's once they turn into stones that we have the problem. So we don't have to worry as much about the crystals being there, but definitely an issue when they have the stones developed. So awesome job, thanks for, for answering that question. As we're getting towards the end of the surgery, I just wanted to reassure you that the patient recovered great. He looks like he has a crab claw now since it was the middle toe that was removed, but it doesn't slow him down any. I left the space open in between the toes so that way his remaining toes would be able to stay in their anatomically correct position. I could have sutured the toes together, but then they would have been pulled towards the middle of the foot and it might have disrupted his balance and his comfort. It looks a little funny, but he doesn't mind. So we talked about a lot today. So just to kind of recap on blood pressure, we talked about how it's very similar to a garden hose. It's affected by the resistance along the actual vessel as well as the, the amount of the blood flow that's going through. But it's also very heavily patient dependent because blood pressure is so tied to how well the heart is functioning. But it's really good that we had a real world example because we also got to see that the Cardell is not perfect. Just as with any machine, there's always going to be potential for a malfunction, so it's really important to use your knowledge in order to assess is this a real reading or did something go wrong. So I'm really glad that we had that real life example. And now that we learned about blood pressure, we can continue to develop on that and next time we'll talk about heart rate and rhythm while doing an eyelid mass removal on a dog. And I hope that brought you some insight into the surgery room today, but I'm sure it also jump-started some thoughts questions, comments, ideas, and be sure to leave them in the comment section below so that way we can continue to collaborate and learn together. 
So for instance, what would you have done differently? Do you think I should have addressed the blood pressure earlier on in the surgery? Would you have done something about that weird reading that we got later on? What were your thoughts when you saw that? Let me know in the comment section below. And thanks for watching. Let's continue to learn together. I'm Dr. Megs, and this is Everyday Vet.